I remember early on when we were realizing the value of security cameras. Most of them were in stores. Mm -hmm. Now they're in a lot of private homes outside. And all, but most of it was stores then. And what we learned was you go to store number one and it had X system, you know. You go to store number two, it had a different system, not compatible. with. The, you go to store number three, that had a different system, not compatible with the prior two. Right, so right. It, was, it was time consuming, a real challenge to, to, to get it. Now I think they're, they're uh, streamlining a lot of that, you know, and uh, uh, they're getting it a lot quicker. On one compact disc, you can get the whole block, you know. So. Right, right. Well, people have them in their homes. They could just go on their yeah. computer and check out the camera on their front door, you know. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. If you get these porch burglars these days, it's good to have something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It, uh, it's it's unbelievable. So, I mean, so how long did you spend? Uh, you were the CEO of Joint Terrorist Task Force, right? Yeah, I was. I was assigned to the JTTF for technically nineteen years, um, and uh, I was the CEO for about four or five of those years. Wow. I I made. Uh, I was a lieutenant when I went into the JTTF. I made captain. They kept me there. And I was promoted deputy inspector, inspector, and deputy chief there. Wow. Um, you must yeah. have liked you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you, you know what? The, the, the NYPD uh, is very thirsty for knowledge because we want to know how to protect, how to deploy all these resources that we have. Right. So we, we would uh, educate Commissioner Kelly at the time and Commissioner Bratton and so forth on um, the latest updates on what was going on around the world and then they would uh, direct their resources to reflect what was going on around the world you know what I'm saying right. to try to prevent an attack you know did you do much traveling to other countries when you were the CEO I did some I, I, I went to uh, Saudi Arabia Jordan China Europe uh, yeah I did some over, over that time you know uh, one thing with the JTT after way it's worked out is in New York is the detectives travel with the agents, you know, they'll go to Africa, right. Europe, Asia, wherever they have to go, they go. Uh, it, it's a very, it's a very, the word joint, it's joint, you know, uh, right. you know, I mean, it's an FBI led, you know, they have, they're led from their headquarters, but, uh, you know, they incorporate not only the NYPD, the Port Authority, the, um, other other members of the task force, like 60 or 70 uh, units, you know, different units in it. Now, let me ask you something, and without uh, mentioning a specific case, which I, I know you, you're not really allowed to talk about, What what is the biggest threat regarding terrorism uh, that the United States is facing now, or New York City is facing now? Well, I mean, in, in my opinion, uh, like ter as far as terrorism threats go, um, it's still it's, it's still going to be you know uh, an extremist Islamist group uh, coming here. You know you do have to keep your eye on domestic groups. Uh, you know with this turmoil in the election, uh, what's going on now, and uh, you know a lot of people you know are very disturbed by what's going on. Either either you're a Democrat, or you're a Republican, or whatever whatever your your, your vantage point is, and once there's a final decision being made, uh, you might see some domestic activity, you know, people uh, rebelling about what, whatever decision is made by, uh, you know, with the election, you know. Right, right. Um, so you're, you're seeing domestic terrorism as a p potentially a uh, problem in the future? Yeah, well, there was just a, uh, you know, during the, um, the riots that we had over the summer, there was a shooting out in uh, California. Uh, there's actually a couple of shootings out in California and it was on a base uh, uh, in a federal building I think it was in Oakland and uh, one of the uh, federal officers was shot this was a security officer and killed another one was wounded and then that same individual shot it out with a local cop in another part of California and he was from a group called um, uh, I can't I, 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 I got a mental block uh, but anyway, it'll come to me. But he was uh, associated uh, with a um, what's it? Uh, oh, the Boogaloo right, Boys. A right uh, wing, the, the Proud Boys. Right wing, uh, Boogaloo Boys. Right. Okay. And, right. I, I've heard of that group. Yeah. yeah. And what they, from my uh, understanding of it, and I, I've done a lot of research on it, is they don't have like one subject that they. Uh, some of them are white supremacists. Some of them are 
uh, Second Amendment uh, advocates, some some of them are re religious. They have different motivations, but they've uh, they they've joined hands. And there's a lot of militias in 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 the heartland of the country, even upstate New York. Uh, so uh, you have to be careful of everything, you know. I mean, you know, uh, right. you know. Well, I was uh, just like, for example, Antifa, and I was a little baffled by um, if you ask certain groups, they'll they'll say, and I don't want to get political here, but they'll say, "Oh, there's no proof that Antifa exists," and I'm like, "No, no proof." What do you mean? They're organized. They come to demonstrations in buses. They all dress alike. They're armed with these huge mace canisters. They're having pallets of bricks being delivered to, pro, you know, to protest sites. How is that not an organized group? And that all that, what I just said, costs money. Who's giving them the money? Well, how come that hasn't been traced by the FBI? Is there an, is there an investigation, you know? I, I mean, I don't know if there's an over, overhead investigation of, of Antifa, but uh, I know from my experience with the conventions throughout the country, uh, you know, my time, uh, they are organized, uh, they are well-financed, uh, they have tremendous communications capabilities, uh, they are led. Uh, the only, uh, I saw on TV, it was actually captured on video uh, over the summer, there was a uh, a, a, a white guy, you know, dressed in black, like they, they call Black Lock, uh, a lot of these Antifa guys. Mm -hmm. And he was directing other guys, other younger Antifa guys, you know, to, to, to go over there, get, see that barrier, throw that in the, you gotta throw that in, the, in front of the police and all that. And then they'd come back and he, I, he saw it, he was handing them money. He's like giving them dollar bills or, you know, 20s or whatever he was giving them. Right. So there's, there's, there's financial uh, backing here, there's leadership. Uh, there's uh, there's good communications with Antifa, um, you know, but I'm out of it, so I don't know what. No, I understand. Know. You know, something what sort of uh, broke my heart about watching the NYPD getting attacked by these people, was the fact that they were hampered by not being allowed to use their training and use all the tools that they have as a police department. For example, mounted. Uh, Aviation. I never saw a damn helicopter up there during those. And helicopters are intimidating. You know that. So a horse. How about drones? The, the, drones? the demonstrators were able to split off into other areas. What if you had a drone? But they didn't use any of the tools. And I'm sure they were being held back by the politics uh, that exist. You know. How many times have you worked Times Square or these concerts in Central Park? You know, uh, Simon and Garfunkel or whatever. Diana Ross. Right. And they had a, a, a mounted presence. Yes. You know, pe people are very intimidated by a, a two-ton animal, uh, yes. you know, coming at you. Uh, but that's, you know, that's the life that we're living now. Uh, well, you know, you we know. had we had Chief Anamone on uh, uh, last year, and uh, he potentially, you know, wrote the book on disorder control. I know he right. studied, studied disorder control all over the world. And it's not that the NYP, the NYPD doesn't have the capability to end a riot in, in, a, in an hour. They do. But you can't end it when you use tactics that were being used 20 years ago that were proved to be a failure. And that means not locking up the leaders, not making arrests, not moving in there. And, you know, you take what well, they always tell you, you take the leader out, you just cut the head off the horse, you know. And we're not, we learned all of those things years ago, but you know, when you get the politics that be don't allow the police to do their job, it gets very scary. And the police, of course, become the target of the violence. Yeah. And and you look at what they're wearing. They're wearing, I don't know, the ballistic vest. I'm talking about the, the, the demonstrators, you know, the Antifa guys. They're wearing helmets. They're wearing masks. They're wearing some kind of vest. You can see that it's, you know, um, and, and, you know, they have all kinds of uh, weapons, uh, you, you know, unconventional weapons. Um, and then they, you see video of them like placing uh, pallets of uh, bricks and s sticks and signs and, and all that that can be used as weapons, you know, a block away from the demonstration. And, and they have all this, uh, so it's, it, it is heavily financed, you know? Right, and, right and, exactly. And I think yeah. that's, you know, that just shows that someone is supporting it and it's being, you know, it's being allowed yeah. and, uh, you know, I think the, if any, it, it was heartbreaking, as I said, to see our police, the NYPD, being attacked 
yeah. bricks and all kinds of weapons. Uh, and and one, one thing that I saw on TV also was the Chicago police having fireworks f- shot at them. Yep. And I was almost like, why are they there? If they're not there to keep peace or quell these riots, why are they there? Because then they become the target of the, they're not protesters, they're rioters, you know. I agree with you. I saw that video. They were like, like in a, a big uh, dry fountain. It looked like a, a fountain, a water fountain that wasn't on. And they, they were surrounding the fountain. And all they were was catching, catching rocks and bottles, and that's what they were doing. They weren't protecting. What are they protecting the fountain? I don't know. Maybe I don't. Right. Know. What were they exactly? What are they doing there? If they're not allowed to do their job, yeah. what are they doing there? You yeah, know, yeah. They should put the entire city council there. Let them sit, stand there, and see what that's like. You yeah. Know? You know, like police officers now have uh, these body cameras, right. and I think I think they're invaluable. I think I think it's a good thing uh, because now you have. An eyewitness, the, the, besides you, because they don't believe you. you right. Number one, they don't believe the guy. But now you have the video camera, and you know cops don't want to shoot people for the sake of shooting people. No, of course, you're reacting. You're reacting to things that are funny. So, what 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 I wish is that these perps had body cameras, so the people of the city and, and the country can see what these guys are doing when right. they're not interacting with the cops. You know, when they're dealing drugs, when they're knocking the old lady down to the ground, when they're you know, doing robberies and right. shooting people, you know, so, you know. Well, you know, the thing is, too, it's so it's so hard to be a police officer because all your actions are videotaped, whether it's a uh, a handheld phone camera, your own body camera, but they're, you know, they, they get in cops' faces and stick these cameras in their faces, and I think they have to address that in the law. Like, wh- when does it cross the line? There was the one video recently with this woman spit in a cop's face and yeah, he yeah. locked her up. But yep. like, did she think that was going to be okay? Like she was going to get away with that? Yeah. And in, in the days of coronavirus, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. She spits in his face. Yeah. yeah. That's perfect. You know? Yeah. Crazy. I mean, I met to some young officers, you know, when I can, and I tell them when you had that uniform on, when you're at work, you have to believe you have to act like you are on a movie set. You are being, videotape no matter where you are you don't know it there's people in the windows taping right. you you know just not not trying to catch there's cameras you. outside every location everywhere everywhere, too. You know, yeah. everywhere so okay. um you know and also you know just state the fact uh, state what you observe state the truth don't embellish don't do nothing uh if, if you lose the case better luck next time let the guy walk He's probably, nowadays, he's probably walking anyway. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys get called for a gun, they're out the next day. It's with, unbelievable. It's unbelievable. bail form, yeah, it, mm-hmm. bail yeah. reform. It's just, uh, it's That's almost like when we first came on when, you know, they used to call it the revolving door, and that was just because the jails were so packed, they had no room to put them, you know. The jails and, are empty now, and, and, and yeah, they, right. now, now they just refuse to put them in. But, you know, what's happened? Uh, shootings have doubled in the city this year. Homicides are way ahead of last year. 35 40 percent right you know these are people's these are people's lives these are people yeah. you know I don't the people, you know the people that uh in the neighborhoods that you work the seven one the seven five all the busy precincts in brooklyn they want the police they don't even want to hear that word defund the police which is no, no. sort of a just a real bad idea you know and the same thing you know in the busy uh precincts in manhattan you know in queens no one wants yeah. to defund the police I mean, I just think that that's part of the overall um, strategy now of just really emptying the prisons and the jails, uh, you know, because I think it became a political thing that the United States had the most prison inmates in the world, and they're trying to, like, correct that overnight, you know? Yeah, yeah. I just mean, this guy, the guy who just um, got, got shot and killed by St. John the Divine, who was firing at the police, Yeah, he was a career criminal. I know. He was I also know. an illegal alien. Could have solved that many ways. He could have been yep. deported, and he wouldn't have been a problem anymore. And that's the second major cathedral in New York City in like a year or two that somebody walking in there with with malign thoughts, with a gallon, at least one gallon. I think the other guy in St. Pat's had two gallons of uh, gasoline. Right. What, what, you know what are they thinking? You know, what are they going to torch the place? You know. You know. The, the, you got you, you. You need the police. You know, you need the police. You need a professional police force. You know, no, no doubt. And you know, some we were always trained that uh, you brought up something. You know, when you made these gun collars years ago, 
a lot of times you'd make the gun collar and that would be it. But within the, the era of CompStat, you make the gun collar, you debrief the guy and said, where can we get more guns? And yeah. if he told you, you'd follow it up with a search warrant. But when you first came on a job, they wanted no part of that shit. The police department like, didn't, and the DA's office wanted no part of it. Yeah, and yeah, that's true. that's true. You know, yeah. CompStat, they got together with the DA and said, look, we got to follow through with this stuff. This is how we'll take a bite out of crime. And, you know, and you're right. And you know what? The reason they didn't want to do it is because of overtime. But you know what? In order to – policing costs money. You know, I mean, yes. you, know, just, you, know you, you have to accept it. Or, or you're going to have crime being rampant. You know? so. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, Chief, I don't know if you realize, but we've, I think we, we've spoken now for a, an hour and uh, 50 minutes almost. One oh, okay. So it's probably uh, about the time we should start saying – Goodbye. This has been fascinating. And um, you had some amazing career, you know, and uh, the fact that you're um, mentoring cops, you know, I, one of the things that I love about doing this show, Police Off the Cuff and Real Crime Stories is all the great cops I get to meet and talk to, you know, Mikey Heinrichs, uh, you know, great, great guy, you know, and if you looked at him, there's it, 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 always humor in this stuff too. If you looked at him, I said, he's a fucking accountant. And then it turns out, no, no, this guy was, is, or was a great, great cop. You're just looking at him. He doesn't fit that like mold, you know, of, of this great cop, Tommy Kennedy, one of the legends of the three, two anti-crime, you know, uh, Christopher Strom, who wrote the book, Brooklyn to Baghdad, you know, where he used the skills he learned on his job. Right, right. The brief people, I don't know if you read that book, but no, I didn't, yeah. the brief people that were bomb makers and all of that stuff, you know, Tremendous, you know, Chief Louis Anamone, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. just I, just, I can't even name all the guys we interviewed. Great cops, great detectives, great bosses, and for me, it's my uh, privilege to meet you guys. And uh, it's, uh, I hope that this show helps some young cops and seeing this stuff and some buffs. Maybe we'll get some hot-looking women to watch this, you know, say, hey, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is some interesting stuff, you know. Chief, you have yeah. any last thoughts? Any last words? So the, the only thing I like to say is thank you for having me, number one, uh, Phil. I really enjoyed it. And uh, for the young officers out there, um, use as many resources as you can. Read books, uh, use the internet, uh, documentaries. Uh, oh, there's a lot of information out there. And learn as much as you can. And, 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 and compartmentalize it in your brain somewhere. Because you never know you're going to come up on a situation where a little bit of advanced knowledge might open up a door to a major break in the case, you know? Absolutely. So, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And I, so I just want to thank you for coming on the show. And I, I want to right now invite you again on the show for a future episode. You know, we uh, sometimes talk about things like the Gilgo beach murders, you know, and we'd love to have, you know, your expertise with your investigative knowledge on some of this stuff. It, it seems like when you get these big cases, all these civilians now become these unbelievable experts on, on serial killers, you know, and you're like, what do they know about it? You know, they just, they know what they've read about it, but Hey, they want to, you know, they want to buff out and lend their opinion to it. That's fine. You know, uh, are you familiar with the Delphi homicides, the no. Delphi murders? No. So it, it's just exactly what you just said. It, it was a tragic case. Uh, it's going on four years. Uh, I, I, I track it every day. Two young girls, uh, 12 and 13 year old walking through like a nature park in uh, Indiana. And, uh, they actually see a male approaching them. And one girl has the sense to take a photo, uh, a video of, of him uh, as he as he approaches. And he ends up killing both of them. Uh, they haven't released a whole bunch of information that, that they were sexually uh, abused and all like that. That's what I think happened. But um, I follow it every day. But, uh, and like there's a multiple number of podcasts, uh, uh, people that they're obsessed with this case, rightfully so. It's a tragic mm -hmm. case. But, you know, there's, it's like a whole new uh, industry coming out, a whole new uh, these podcasts, you know, so. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Look, I'm having a ball doing it myself, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there's so much information. But I also, one of the things that we wanted to do with Police Off the Cuff and now I'm doing these real crime stories is just sort of, um, you know, get on tape, get on video the great careers of some of the great cops and detectives that worked in New York City because you know your stories can die with you one day, you know. Yeah, and these yeah. are great, great stories. You know, unless you're going to write a book or do something like that, every cop that's done 20 years has some 
has great stories, you know, right. some better than others. Yeah. But, you know, I, I would write a book. I, I would write a book, but I write like I talk. It's one <laughs> mind, it's, it's one mind on sentence. You know? Yeah. yeah. You're the Brooklyn guy. You're the Brooklyn <laughs> yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Chief, thank you so much. I'm Bill Cannon from Real Crime Stories. This episode with Chief Joseph Herbert. Fascinating. And hopefully we'll have him back one another time or multiple times. Chief, again, thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Good, Good luck. Peace off the cuff. Real Crime Stories signing off. Thanks, Bill. Bye now.